I'm going to open the hearing on House Bill 582 and call uh, the sponsor, Rep Representative Tom Coates. Mr. Chairman? I'll, I'll probably misappropriate it. Uh, could we at least mention it to the testifiers that if they've testified before, we haven't forgotten what they said? I intend to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, committee members. For the record, my name is Guy Comfoire, and I represent Tom Al 7 uh, the town of Santa Monica. Um, I've been involved in Second Amendment issues since I was a child. There was a time back in the 70s when the NRA didn't send hats out for no reason at all. And, uh, my father would um, send me around the door, neighborhood door knocking to see if I could get 10 members to sign up just to get a free hat. So I started off in this young and um, I came up, was fortunate enough to become a board member to go to New Hampshire in uh, 1993, turbulent gun years in the 90s. When this bill came up in one form or another through the 90s up until now, um, as we all know, the concealed carry law was enacted in 1923. New Hampshire is the 92nd year of the license concealed carry. A neighbor in Vermont has never required a license or permission from bureaucrats to carry a concealed self-defense firearm. Right now, neither state requires a, carry, a, a license to carry a firearm open. Um, openly in Vermont, obviously, with their um, constitutional style carry. Both New Hampshire and Vermont are consistently ranked second safest and lowest crime states in America. Um, it isn't a secret that criminals prefer unarmed victims. I feel that um, this is a great time for this bill to pass. The Senate has um, Senate has paved the way for us. And uh, this bill is the same exact bill as the Senate bill. And um, I'm not going to take up much of your time because I know a lot of people behind me are going to be uh, testifying on every angle on why this should pass. And I would ask for all your support. I would ask the committee to pass this and not retain this and uh, follow the Senate's lead. And again, I'm not going to take up a lot of your time, so I'll end it right there. I have a question. I have a bill on the first page, line 11 and 12. Uh, there's, there's a change here. It says, unless the applicant is prohibited by New Hampshire statute from both owning and possessing a firearm. Now, I, I just carried my firearm in Alabama and Virginia and West Virginia and all these states that we have reciprocity with. Yes. If this were to pass, it would jeopardize the reciprocity. No, because you still, if you choose, can still apply and get your license to carry, which would not affect that at all. Well, follow up. A follow up, yeah. It's a little troubling to me the fact that it is a, a, a suitable person is used in other statutes for licensing. Uh, I've always tried to protect that. Oh, this is my 29th year up here I'm trying to protect that. Yeah, and I remember you know, I'm you a little, little concerned the night, about that, yeah. that statement. <laughs> Thank you. I, ha I have a question, and it's just dealing with the same thing. It says, unless the person is prohibited by New Hampshire statute from both owning and possessing a firearm, under 173B, a person can be prohibited from possessing a firearm because of a domestic violence conviction or something else, but he is never prohibited from owning the weapon. The way I read this bill, the way it's worded, a person who is under uh, a domestic violence restraining order could still get a permit because he is not prohibited, because he isn't prohibited from owning and possessing. The and makes it problematic the way I read the bill. Do you, do you agree or disagree? Uh, well, obviously I disagree with that. Um, as fact, you know, as far as them owning but not being able to possess, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Um, if they, either way, if they're going to commit a crime, I don't really think any of this matters to somebody who's going to commit a crime, whether or not it is legal for them to carry. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yeah. I'm just curious, where, what line were you looking at, okay, sir? It's, it's line 11 and 12. Uh, 11 and 12. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. If Chair. it was, if, if, just for, if it was or, I think it would be perfectly fine. I think and makes it so that it's a, it's a problem. That's my, that's my reading of the statute, any, of the bill, anyway. Because I mean, having been on the committee for a number of years and having been in law enforcement for considerably longer, I'm familiar with reading statutes and it scares me whenever I put one bill in and the drafters turn it out exactly word for word for what I did. But uh, I, I, just, I just see that on first glance as this being an, uh, an issue. Any further, any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Do you, do you still have that free hat you got? No, I don't remember. I don't remember. I just remember uh, the first time out, I left the applications and nobody sent them in. And my father said, now you got to collect the checks off. Said, you can mail them in. And I was, I was probably 11, 12 years old. I don't know if you remember the days. I don't know <laughs> Thank you. Representative Howard. Chairman, for the record, my name is Raymond Howard. I represent Belknap 8, which is all combined in Wilmington. And my testimony today is uh, going to be about what I think is the most egregious part of the application for a license. And it's under the signature certification for release of information. And I'll read the line that really has a, I have a problem with. I consent to the release of information about my ability and fitness to carry a pistol or revolver by employers, schools, medical psychiatric services, law enforcement agencies, and other individuals and organizations. I don't understand what other individuals and organizations are, but this information of all these, released to all these individuals and organizations that I own a gun I feel it's probably none of their business, but it also exposes me as a gun owner and the possibility of my property being robbed. I, I have a question for you. Where, where is that file? Uh, this is under the application the to get a pistol yeah. oh, yeah. It's right on the, uh, the bottom under the consent release. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. this should be changed. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, do you have anything for us? Uh, I'll take the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Does this mean, if, for instance, I, I own a store and I got a sign in the front that said no guns allowed, that you could walk in with your gun concealed? You're a private business, yeah, and you have the right to maintain your property the way you see fit. So I guess as a responsible citizen, if I see that sign, no, I will not walk in here to conceal it. And if you do, what do I do? Follow up? Yeah. Well, I know. <laughs> well, you wouldn't know I had it because mm -hmm. it would be concealed. So that's kind of an irrelevant question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any further questions? Seeing that, thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Abrams. Mr. Chair, thank you. Members of the committee. Um, I rise in support of this bill and I ask you to uh, recommend ought to pass. Um, I just have uh, two quick points on this. This deals with whether or not a uh, an individual can conceal a carry firearm concealed or with a jacket over the top of it. Um, if uh, the police chief has denied them a pistol revolver license for any reason or if they haven't applied for one. Um, we had a former police chief in my town who denied at least four people who I know of a pistol revolver license. Uh, none of them were crazy. None of them were criminals. Uh, some of them were armed service vets. I think at least three of them were service vets. Um, but all of them had either filed formal complaints against the police department or they'd spoken against uh, the department in public meetings or pay raises or police, police cruisers or other warrant articles. And the police chief 
had has since passed away, he never answered at any public meeting or in any other venue why he denied uh, pistol revolver license for those people. The second point is uh, there have been a lot of studies on gun control. Every criminologist, that is every professional who studies uh, firearms policy and crime policy who has changed their position on gun control has switched from supporting gun control to supporting gun rights. Uh, they haven't all uh, moved over to support constitutional carry, but uh, many of them have. John Arlott Jr. wrote the now famous book, More Guns, Less Crime, and he broke the states up into three classes of states. There were the shall issue states, as New Hampshire is, the Vermont still is, as Montana and other states uh, still are. All of the shall issue states were very low violent crime states and very low property crime states. New Hampshire used to have the lowest violent crime rate in the country. Um, as we've uh, lost our self-defense rights and as we have uh, moved slowly over to becoming a main issue state, the crime rate has been on the rise. We're still in the bottom 10 as far as violent crime is concerned, but we're not the lowest crime state in the country. There are the main issue states that tend to have moderate crime rates, and then there are the gun control states and cities. All of the highest violent crime rates are in gun control states and cities. The reason is that gun control laws do not and have not uh, disarmed criminals. The gang leader who tried to wrestle the gun from me in the brawl that occurred in my home had two prior attempted murder convictions. He and others had outstanding arrest warrants and uh, had he managed to get any type of uh, one of the available you know, kni knives or uh, spear bottles or one of the other potential weapons, he could have done any amount of damage. Um, it would, so uh, two or three of his friends to pull him off, off of me, and he was trying to wrestle the gun from me at the time that he was pulled off. Uh, the police made absolutely no effort to go after any of the criminals. Um, they weren't arrested, even though they had outstanding arrest warrants. They were all let go, and uh, most of them have gone on to commit many other crimes. Uh, uh, so I very strongly implore you to uh, support this bill and recommend office pass for it. Thank you very much. Representative Walsh has a question. I decline to answer any questions. What about that kind of important to clarify the attention? Representative McConnell. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Bonham, Mr. Chairman. If people decide to testify, aren't they supposed to answer questions? They don't have to answer questions. There's no requirement that they answer questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a strong supporter of 582. I like the looks of this very much. If we pass this, we'll be joining six other states, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, Vermont, Wyoming, and Oklahoma. And there are 21 states that uh, have bills like this up before them this year. Um, this, it seems to me, the constitutional carry movement in a lot of ways is similar to the uh, concealed carry movement in a lot of ways in that when it was first introduced in Florida, everybody said it would be a nightmare and it would be a horrendous thing and that it wouldn't work out well for anybody. And exactly the opposite has proven to be the case. Uh, if you look at places like Kennesaw, Georgia, for example, where they require people to have firearms, the crime rate drops like a rock. It's been that way in Kennesaw for some time and stayed that way. And uh, I think this is an excellent bill. I'm very pleased with it. I'm anxious to see it passed, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, thank sir. You. Representative Itzi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, my one regret about this bill is that I'm not a co-sponsor. Uh, I've co-sponsored similar legislation in the past. I think it is an extremely good idea. Uh, one thing you have to remember about uh, concealed carry licenses is they don't stop criminals from carry concealed. They only affect law-abiding people. One of my greatest concerns about the way, from speaking to my former police chief, is the manner in which concealed carry licenses are often uh, utilized by local police. What he said to me was, whenever we uh, answer a domestic violence uh, call, we look to see if they have a concealed carry license. And if they do, then we go in with extra caution. And what really 
I thought that's that's really the reverse of the way things ought to be because the one thing you know is that somebody is has obtained a concealed carry license is that they are already disposed to submitting their constitutional rights to government. They are intellectually at the get-go more disposed to submitting to government. On the other hand, the person, if you get a domestic call uh, from someone that doesn't have a concealed carry license, then the one thing you don't know is if they have a firearm that they've obtained either privately or illegally, and they are disposed to use it. That's when I would be the most alerted, is if they did not have a concealed carry license rather than that they did. Its presence and utilization, utilization is, creates, I think, dangerous situations. It creates a reverse perception of reality. And uh, the idea of constitutional carry with a provision for a license if you need reciprocity in another state is the wisest way to go. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I have a question. Good. Let's assume you were a police officer and you were responding to a domestic violence call. Would you be at all worried that one of them might have a firearm, whether they, they were on a list or not? Yeah, I would. I mean, no. certainly, and certainly, if I'm going to domestic violence call, is somebody who is presumably in a violent state of mind. So, if they don't have a concealed carry license and they do have a firearm, they're the person more likely to use it. Um, would it not be reasonably prudent to assume that any time you go to a, a a call like that, that they may have a firearm and they may be one of I would agree with that, yes. Thank you. You want to clarify? No further questions? Thank you. Ann Rice. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Ann Rice. I'm the Deputy Attorney General and I appear in opposition to this bill. And as many of you know, our office does not generally take positions on gun bills, uh, any bills relating to gun permitting and that sort of thing. Uh, we have left that as a poly policy decision for the legislature. But um, we feel a need to take a position on this one uh, for a couple of reasons. The first is that the Department of Safety is one of our client agencies. We provide legal counsel to the Department of Safety. And this bill would put um, their employees in an untenable legal position, um, as it would for police chiefs. And for that reason, we oppose. Um, as you know, and uh, Sergeant Haggerty testified earlier, the Department of Safety is responsible for issuing non-resident permits. And before doing, those, doing so, now they go through a suitability kind of an assessment as they would, as any local police chief does. Um, House Bill 582 would prohibit the Department of Safety from considering whether any out-of-state person who is applying for a license is barred from uh, possessing or owning a gun by federal law. They would be required to issue a permit even if the person was barred by federal law. And that puts them in the unenviable position of either violating state law or federal law. The U.S. Attorney's Office has already indicated that if the Department of Safety employees issue gun licenses in accordance with the way that House Bill 582 is written, that they could be considered for criminal prosecution for aiding and abetting and sanctioning someone who is not permitted to have a gun under federal law. So um, that would expose Department of Safety Department of Safety employees to criminal liability, it would also expose, expose them to significant civil liability. Because by issuing a permit, you are officially sanctioning, government sanctions of someone who is not supposed to have a gun. We think that that's a bad policy. We don't want to put the Department of Safety in that. The impact is the same on police chiefs, but probably a little bit even more so. By issuing a permit um, is, Police chiefs now have to go through a suitability um, uh, assessment 
And they consider things like, is there a New Hampshire protective order that's active? And is, if the person is barred from um, possessing a gun under that, uh, what other information they may have in the federal laws. This bill would prevent police chiefs from considering those things or whether the person has an active New Hampshire protective order. Because the New Hampshire protective order, as Representative Thal re recognized, only prohibits the possession of a gun. It does not prohibit the ownership of a gun. So the way that this bill is written, even a person who is barred under New Hampshire law because they have a protective order could still be issued a permit. That's a problem. Um, if House Bill 582 passes, we will be put in a position of having to advise our client agency, the Department of Safety, not to follow state law and to follow the federal law. That's what we would anticipate doing. I also want to say the bill mandates for Department of Safety to go out and negotiate reciprocity agreements with all the other states. If New Hampshire eliminates the requirement of considering federal, pro federal prohibitors as part of their uh, issuance of gun permits, they're not going to be able to get reciprocity with any other state. Even the constitutional carry states that were named earlier all have a requirement that a person cannot carry a gun if they are prohibited by federal law. And that's either written into the this, this state law or it incorporates the federal prohibitors. New Hampshire would be the only state that would issue a permit without considering whether a person is barred under federal law. And they're not going to get reciprocity agreements. So you're, again, putting the Department of Safety in a, in a really untenable position. <coughs> so for that reason, we oppose this bill. And I'm happy to take questions. Representative Welch. Ms. Rice, uh, <coughs> I just returned from a trip to Alabama. And before I went, I was wondering whether or not I could carry my firearm there. So I researched their law. And in 2013, they, they changed their law, and I, I, I'm only going to paraphrase it because I can't recall exactly how it was read. But they will accept any state's license. And uh, I, I copied the text onto my computer, and I took that with me, too. The question I have is, if lines 11 and 12 were not there, would the rest of the bill be acceptable to the AG's office? Um, I'd have to read through and make sure, I, because this, this then eliminates the suitability requirement. Yeah, that, if a suitability requirement were still there, that's what I'm asking. If the suitability requirement were still there, and the Department of Safety could consider all of the things that it's currently considering in terms of the federal firearms prohibitors, then I don't think that there would be a problem. The problem that we are here concerned about is putting the Department of Safety in a legal position. I am not commenting on the other part of this bill, the policy of concealed permits and issuing concealed permits. I want to make sure that's clear. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Sure. Uh, just a quick question, and as a preface to my question, I'll, I'll bring up a point that's been made on other pieces of legislation, that we always want to know what problem is being solved by any given piece of legislation. Does the legislation solve the problem? In your opinion, what is the problem that's being solved by this legislation? Um, I, I can only refer to what the testimony has been and will be today. I don't, I'm not involved with issuing permits. <coughs> Our office doesn't issue permits. I know that there are people that believe that gun permits are not issued appropriately uh, or, or are denied inappropriately. I can't speak to that because I don't have any personal knowledge about it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. I have, uh, well, basically two questions. The first one is, to your knowledge, has the agent of any licensing agency ever been prosecuted for the actions of a legally issued license? I assume by the question that you're referring to what the U.S. Attorney's Office has said that they would mm -hmm. subject to. I don't know. I don't have any personal knowledge about that. 
Okay, and follow up? Follow up. And uh, my second question would be, you said uh, that if this law was passed, you would have to uh, advise police chief to ignore state law and follow federal law. Uh, Wouldn't that in and of itself, as the chief law enforcement officer of the state, be illegal for the attorney general to do? And I think you misunderstood what I said. First off, it would not be police chiefs. The only people that we can advise are state agencies and state employees. What we would do is advise that if someone were um, not allowed to have a gun under federal law and there had been an application for an out-of-state uh, permit, we would advise that it would be better not to um, issue the, uh, the gun permit. Thank you. I'm just, thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Um, I, I thank you, Attorney Rose, for taking this. I don't see anything in this bill that gives school zones or anything. Should that be in the bill? They're not allowed on school grounds. So we um, I I'm not sure that I can answer that question. I don't know. I think that there's some other statutes that are involved. That we have state statutes that um, deal with uh, school safe zones. So I'm not sure that this impacts that. Okay. Thank, Thank you for the you. question. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your time. All best. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Paul Best. I'm the chair of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. I'm speaking today uh, to you on behalf of the organization in favor of HB 582. Uh, I'll be very brief. There's, there's three reasons I would like to give. Uh, the first is that if this bill were to pass, New Hampshire law would more consistently recognize the inherent uh, constitutional and moral right of people to bear arms in self-defense. Uh, New Hampshire has a strong tradition <coughs> of being pro-freedom and protecting individual rights, and that's a tradition I'm very proud of, and I think we should all be proud of, and this bill is consistent with that tradition. Uh, the second reason I would like to give is that there are, there are real harms caused by cartel. Um, <clears throat> current law uh, is ambiguous in certain cases. Uh, there have been there has been uh, recent legal proceedings uh, questioning whether uh, a gun with a loaded uh, magazine next to it in a vehicle constitutes a loaded firearm. Uh, these these distinctions can be difficult for uh, individuals to understand, and it's very easy for an otherwise law-abiding person who is legally lawfully open carrying. Uh, to become ensnared in the legal process by incidentally uh, covering the gun accidentally. Uh, these are not good reasons for uh, people who have not harmed anyone who are law-abiding to be pulled into the legal process. There are other harms as well. Uh, for example, for, for some people, concealed carry is the only way for them to practically uh, carry because of their work situation or for other reasons. Uh, in those cases, the current law constitutes effectively a waiting period. Uh, if a person believes they're under imminent threat, uh, for example, they're dealing with a stalker or another reason, uh, this, could, this leads to a period of time, two weeks, uh, where they may not have the protection uh, that they have a right to have. Uh, so there are real harms uh, with, with the current law. Um, there's, it's, it's an arbitrary distinction. Uh, many experts recommend concealed carry as a safer alternative, uh, less intrusive alternative, a more effective alternative to open carry. It's strange that state law places no restrictions on open carry and it has restrictions on concealed carry. And the third reason is that there's, there's no uh, credible evidence that passing this bill would create harm. Uh, there are five other states that already have so-called constitutional carry, uh, or they allow concealed carry without a permit. Uh, one of those states is Vermont, which has had it for its entire history, and they have currently the lowest violent crime rate, <coughs> excuse me, in the entire country. So uh, there's, there's, in many of the other states, after having uh, obtained more uh, pro-freedom gun laws, uh, either shall issue or constitutional carry, have seen their violent crime rates drop. Uh, so, in summary, uh, this bill defends a person's inherent right uh, to self-protection. It eliminates a very real existing harms, and there's no credible evidence that it would cause any serious harm to New Hampshire residents. So, 
I recommend that this bill not be retained, uh, that this committee, uh, I hope, will recommend OTP, and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I have one question. Uh, is not New Hampshire a shall issue state? It is New Hampshire a shall issue state. Yes. Thank you very much. Now, one thing, if the committee, we're going to be keep, continue working, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, the committee is, uh, we're going to continue working through the lunch, it's already part way through what we normally take. So if part of you would like to go to lunch, we can do a kind of a rotating thing because this is, at the rate we're going now, we have there to be closed before we get done with this bill. So if you'd like to take, you can go for lunch for a period. Uh, as long as we have a few members here to take testimony, we should be all set. Uh, Chief Sigourney. Okay. Good afternoon. It's actually Shigori, no end. I can't right. pronounce it. That's all right. I, have all the I, heard it works. I already admitted that several times. Um, that's, a, that's a minus mark on my record. Okay. I'm here on behalf of the Chiefs of Police. We oppose this bill, recommend that it be expedient to legislate. Uh, it's not to say that we're opposed to concealed carry. Uh, we think that the bill, should, by making this expedient to legislate, keeping it the way it works right now, uh, it seems to work, I think, fairly really well. It has for over 90 years. No reason to change. I did uh, hear some talking points. Um, I would just bring up a couple things. Um, even in uh, District of Columbia versus Hella, Justice Scalia said, like most rights, the Second Amendment right is not unlimited. It's not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. For example, the sale of weapons prohibitions have been upheld by the amendment or state analogs the majority of the 19th century courts to consider the question held that prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons were lawful under the Second Amendment or state analogs. Um, so, as far as constitutional, even Justice Scalia, who I think we can all agree is probably not one of the more lo liberal of the judges, has set, looked at it historically, going back to the, in, in Heller, he actually looked back to colonial times for his derivation as an individual right, has recognized that concealed carry has long been regulated and is constitutional. Uh, and I'd also point out the New Hampshire Constitution, Bill of Rights, predates the, New Hampshire, the U.S. Constitution. June 2, 1784, it said, when men enter into a state of society, they surrender up some of their natural rights to that society in order to ensure the protection of others. And without such an equivalent, the surrender is void. So, as with any right, there's responsibilities, and it's not unlimited. Uh, a couple points in the bill, uh, and I want to repeat a lot of what was said earlier because I know everybody wants lunch and we've got other, we've got other things. I point out, uh, share many of the same concerns as expressed by uh, Attorney General's office. Um, on page two, three through eight, um, it has the same sort of thing where it just talks about possessing a firearm. But uh, the important thing, it says, on line five, it says the unlicensed transport or carry of a firearm in a vehicle. It talks about firearm. Firearm is, I, I know some of you are very experienced with them. That's a broad term, covers a variety of things. Well, if you look at hunting laws, 2077 talks about carrying a loaded rifle or shotgun. So you've got a conflict between these two laws that would probably have to be sorted out in the courts because you can't under 2077 carry a loaded rifle or shotgun. Uh, I, you know, it, it would, this case law that may indicate how that would come out, but it still would be an inherent conflict. Um, I can, one of my concerns is the liability, and it's not just on select, it's not just on chiefs of police, it's all the licensing authorities. It also goes to some of your boards of selectmen. In many of your smaller towns, and uh, it goes to uh, some of your sheriffs that you're issuing authority and, and licensing authority, and in some towns, the Board of Selectmen is your licensing authority. Uh, they would share that liability, uh, not just, I know uh, Ann Rice testified to or talked about the U.S. Attorney, uh, but I just think there's a liability inherent with that you no longer are going to be able to restrict people uh, to some degree, but there's still going to be restrictions. Not, this isn't a true constitutional 
carry, if you will, because there's still restrictions here. It's just a matter of moving that needle as to where that is. Um, and also, as far as um, reciprocity goes, and I understand uh, what Rep Representative Welch was saying, but a lot of the states with reciprocity with basically, if you look at their laws, and I looked at them all, say, if you have one from this state, we'll rep honor it, except Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, the Attorney General has to certify that it's similar. And if this passes, we will no longer be similar because they have a thing about people who are, uh, they use, don't use the word suitable, but uh, show a, a disregard for the laws. And, and uh, they talk about uh, habitual drunkards as not being able to be, that's in their law. Uh, I think that's, what, I looked at all, I think it's 22, that's the only one I saw that didn't just point blank say, you know, license here, we'll honor it here, but I represent, recognize ours. To the other states, though, that have this constitutional carry, if you will, Wyoming, Alaska, and Arizona, they all incorporate federal prohibitions in their statute. They all set minimum ages. They all, if you want to get that license, or they call it a permit, actually, in those states, you have to adhere to these re requirements. And in fact, in Wyoming, if you read the law carefully, it says it's only for residents that can go without a license. Non-residents still have to have a license from their home state. And it says the residents there have to be able to comply with the requirements, a certain ones of the requirements of the, uh, to get the license, a permit they call it. So in a sense, it's not just you can have it, like Vermont doesn't have anything, if you will. They say if you can get a permit, you don't have to carry if you're a resident. But you still have to meet those requirements of not being admitted to a, a hospital, not being admitted. I think they have a year prior, you can't have been in a um, substance abuse program. Um, <coughs> some of them list uh, misdemeanors, uh, and how frequent those misdemeanors are and how old they can be. But uh, they all have more requirements. This, uh, this still has <coughs> restrictions in it. I mean, if you're, if you're truly saying this is about constitutional, and you know, we have a constitutional right, if you truly believe that it's all there shouldn't be any restrictions. There's still restrictions here. It's just where that we're moving that needle. We think it works well the way it is. I don't think questions. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, if I had my way, I'd move the needle a lot further than what this does. Uh, but who prepared this paper that you gave us? I did. And was it on behalf of the uh, follow-up? Oh. Yeah. Uh, was it on behalf of the uh, chief of police, um, so they would all agree with what's in here? I put it together. I actually, I put it together prior, and I updated it with some stuff as I looked it up. Uh, but no, we didn't bring it to a meeting and vote on it, if you will. But it's a lot of the, the points we have discussed. With some, um, you know, one of the problems we run into is, is it, it, you know, federal law, and, and you know, I, I, recently there was a similar bill in the Senate. A lot of people talked about federal regulations, federal regulations. But that's not in here and so in order for us we don't enforce them per se we'd have to report those to ATF and have them for example the gun free school zone that's a federal law we have a safe school act if you will okay. so it's and there's not the same wording in each so we we if somebody were to be at a, a school we'd have to look at the state law and you know state laws if we saw something that was beyond that Maybe we'd have to report it to ATF if it fit that criteria too. All right, and one last follow-up. Oh. Right. On the last, I believe, yep, yeah, it is the last page. Okay. In the middle, it says concealed carry is a public safety concern. That. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah, put that in there. Yeah. If I could finish, um, uh, you know, it says that we've had a license since 1923. Um, it has been recognized as a public concern since colonial times. Um, you know, that people that conceal carry in this paragraph, you know, has the element of surprise. Criminals typically use concealed carry to get closer to their intended target. Big law enforcement concern. So what my question is, is, you know, where did you get your information that since colonial times that this has been an issue? And, you know, would you lump all concealed carry people into a criminal typically use, you know, concern. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. I, I, there's a great many people, probably in this room, who are carrying lawfully concealed and 
are not a threat to the public safety. So I'm saying, but typically criminals are going to use that method also. Okay. That's, I, I certainly would not pay that. I, su I support concealed carry, Second Amendment. I mean, I'm not, definitely not painting a broad brush over people that carry or have guns or have any ways to it. I've had guns since I was like 11. And my dad gave me a 22 rifle then, you know? Right. That he kept under his control and I couldn't use. Thank you but, for the um, clarification. To, as far as the colonial times, I looked at, uh, well, looked at uh, Heller and other cases when, where they went through some of the learned treatises on the historical, and it was, uh, they talked about the, the criminals would carry concealed back then. The gentlemen carried them, you know. You hear, you know, armed society is a polite society. Well, how would you know somebody's armed if they're concealed to be polite around them, if you will? In other words, we've had open carry much longer than we've had concealed carry, if you will, at least in a, in a, in a sense. And some of the case law refers to some of the historical uh, basis behind it. Uh, no, I didn't go research and actually pull the books, but I looked at some of the case law. And, uh, it was one uh, with New York's uh, arguing as to whether or not, the, uh, you know, Heller was all about self-defense within the home, then he had McDonald talking self-defense in public. But then there's an argument, and, and McDonald was, you had to have a uh, license, a permit, but then they wouldn't issue one. So it became a, a, a forbidden thing by fiat, if you will. But in the in the sense, when you look at some of the other states, they, the, the courts, it hasn't gone all the way to the Supreme Court, but other courts have looked at it and said, um, well, as long as you have one of the two options, you still have the ability to protect yourself, if you will. That's what other courts have said. And they looked at, they quoted somebody in the side of you, but talked about criminals carrying seal. I mean, that's, I mean, not to say, you know, that's not, I'm certain he's not painting people that way either. Okay. I'm not saying that. I certainly don't want to be on saying that. I, it, like I said, many people in this room are probably, and they're all awful people as far as I know, so why would I question that? All right, thank you. Any further questions? Thank you for your testimony. How much revenue would be lost for your agency if HB 582 passes? Uh, well, on a normal year, probably about 500 to 550. We, we do about 50 to 55 on a normal year. After Sandy Hook, that next year I did almost 90 licenses. I mean, I had people coming in saying, I don't even have a gun, but I want a license because it's going to be banned. I'm like, this is New Hampshire. We're not going to ban having licenses and seal carry. Mm -hmm. That's just not the way New Hampshire operates. But if that's what you want, we'll deal with it. And so on a normal year, but there was, I, and I, everybody I know, talk to other chiefs, and I think probably the Department of Safety would verify that particular year, there was a huge spike in people uh, applying for it. But it. And, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Don't follow up. Follow up. How many people actually are employed to process these, these licenses? Well, I mean, myself and my secretary are the ones that typically do most of the work on it. I mean, it's 50. And what I do, I guess I'll go through my pro how I process goes. I get the application, fax the request to the Sheriff's Department because they're our spots terminal. I can't run a NICS check to our agency. I have to, and this has been a problem for us a couple times when the person there is on vacation. I have to wait for them to come back to get the record. But as soon we send out letters to, and I, I deal with the letters in the sense of, uh, I put it on the person, I send the reference. If you have an issue, you need to contact me. So if they don't contact back, I assume that they don't have a problem. Because I believe I'm obligated to issue it within 14 days, no matter what, whether the reference gets back to me or not. And that's how I deal with it. How many people statewide do you know? Do what, issue these? actually process the actual license. I you know, have no idea how many do it. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, you run into the situation, um, well, I, I, Sheriff Rashardi, I had a conversation with him, he was, is an unincorporated town in Carroll County, and the commissioners were doing it, and I said, well, if you read the statute, I kind of read that, that he's supposed to do it for unincorporated, not the commissioners. Um, so we, so you end up with sheriffs, you end up with select boards, um, when I came, the selectmen were doing it, then they turned it over to me. Some places, selectmen still do it. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Chief, for, for providing this information. I'm a little confused, and I, I guess I should have asked this question of the sponsor, but maybe I can get it from your understanding. This legislation looks to remove the requirement to issue a license 
for carry and conceal. Yet it seems on line 22 on the first page, we'd be charging residents of the state $10 for a license. If we're eliminating the license, why are we still charging a resident $10? What's your understanding of that? Because I'm confused by well, that. My understanding is, thank you for the question, that, that goes towards making us not like Vermont, but similar to the other three states that I know of, Alaska, Arizona, and Wyoming. We have a, you can get a, a license, optional, <coughs> they call it a permit. We call it a license. Pennsylvania calls it a license. I know that's a beef in terms of wealth. But, so you have it, so you, when you go to these other states, you can carry it. So it's, an op it's optional. You do not have to have it, but it's optional when you go to these other states that offer reciprocity. Okay. <laughs> Good. I just have one question. The question was, uh, you know, how much money do you think you'd lose uh, if this bill passes and everything is uh, sufficient for issuing a license in New Hampshire for those who want to travel to other states? Wouldn't you still have some income, but it's not possible to tell how much? Yeah, it, it's not possible to tell how much because I don't know how. There's, there's a couple factors going into this. One is there'll probably be fewer that apply, um, and they're also going to be for a longer period. I want to, I, I, I want to bring that up. Right now, we have to be at least four years long. So if somebody were to come in today and their birthday was in January, they actually would have four years and 11 months because we have to run out at the end of their birth month. So we're actually going, adding it. So not only are they, not that it's here or there in a sense, but just realize that we're all, we can almost get to five years now and this would put it almost to six years. For what that's worth, doesn't matter. But um, it, there would be fewer coming in because of that time frame um, and fewer would need to because they may not tr feel they need to travel and go into the States, but they could. But, uh, you know, I, I guess from my standpoint, for $500, it really doesn't, it's not going to make or break anything. I, I look at it from a safety standpoint. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Emily, is it Sand? Sand Blade? Yeah, you did good. You got it right. Hey, another one for me. <laughs> well, when you have an unusual last name, you, know, you get used to it. Um, I'm here to speak. I'm Emily Sandlade. I live in Manchester. Uh, I'm here to speak today in favor of HB 582. And I know that uh, I'm, I'm violating a basic rule, which is you never keep a legislator from their launch. So I'll try to make it quick. Um, we're, we're, we're going to talk about uh, why uh, the discussion that we're having and most of it's centering around public safety and whether it's increased or decreased by the repeal of licensing. And particularly, uh, those opposed to this bill will claim that it will result in increased harm to women. And that's a subject I'm quite interested in, obviously. The numbers simply don't bear this out. I've included several tables of data which are being passed out. Um, from recognized sources that will give a good picture of the reality. The very first table is homicide victims by gender and by country, and it lists the homicide rates for both men and women and correlates that with the number of firearms per 100 people in that country. On the last page of that table are the correlations between homicide rates and firearm ownership rates. This data was compiled by the United Nations. There's a slightly negative correlation overall, regardless of gender, between firearms ownership and homicide rates. That means, for the mathematically impaired, that <laughs> higher firearm ownership is slightly correlated with a lower homicide rate. It's not a strong correlation, but it certainly argues against the idea that higher firearms ownership rates result in more homicides. The real surprise is that the correlation is even stronger for women. Women who live in countries where there's a high level of firearm ownership are less likely to be victims of homicide than those who don't. 
The next table, homicide victims by state, sorted by descending homicide rate, is a listing of homicide rates for each state and the Brady campaign score, which is a measure of how restrictive firearm laws are for that state. All data, except for the Brady campaign score, was supplied by the FBI. On the second page is listed another interesting statistic, or at the bottom of that page. Again, there is a small negative correlation between how restrictive a state's firearm laws are and the homicide rate. In other words, the more restrictive the laws, the higher the homicide rate. The last chart, which um, is actually a graphic, and it's got the data to go with it. In all cases, I tried to give all the data that we're working with, unlike you know uh, our phones tend to do. Next is a chart that shows the homicide rates in New Hampshire and the United States plotted against the two states that have significant experience with constitutional carry. All of the data in this table was supplied by the FBI. Vermont has always had constitutional carry, and Alaska instituted constitutional carry in 2003. The graph for Vermont shows that the homicide rate has always been much lower than the rate for the United States overall. Alaska tells a more interesting story, however. <coughs> Prior to the 1980s, Alaska had a rate that was considerably higher than the overall U.S. rate. Alaska passed shell issue legislation in 1995 and constitutional carry in 2003. The rate of homicides has dropped to that at or below that of the overall United States rate. Note that the graph for New Hampshire is similar to that for Vermont. For Vermont. Although New Hampshire does not have constitutional carry yet, firearms laws in this state are rated a D minus by the Brady campaign. In spite of that, the homicide rate is quite low. The table attached to the chart gives the year-by-year -year data for homicide rates for several states that have passed constitutional carry. Some are too recent to show results in the data. They've only passed constitutional carry with only a year or two of data to show for it. And there's data for New Hampshire and the U.S. overall. Okay, what can we conclude from all this data? And there's a pile of it. Uh, I expect that, that you'll want to peruse it at your leisure because there's so much of it. Number one, internationally, we can conclude that there's no correlated benefit in restricting firearms ownership on homicide rates, whether for men or for women. In fact, a higher number of firearms in private hands per capita was correlated with a lower homicide rate. This effect was stronger for women than for men. In the U.S., there is no correlated benefit in restricting firearms ownership on homicide rates. And the third thing that we can conclude is Vermont's experience with constitutional carry shows that the homicide rate has stayed consistently low in spite of a lack of licensing. Alaska's experience shows a notable, greater than average drop in homicide rates after constitutional carry was instituted. Those who oppose constitutional carry because of blood running in the streets must be terribly disappointed by the experience of Vermont and Alaska. The same claims were made by the same opponents when concealed carry laws were liberalized. Instead, homicide rates declined quite significantly to the lowest rates in over 50 years. As of January 1, 2015, five states have constitutional carry, and the officer who testified right before me forgot to include Arkansas in that list. 36 states have shall issue concealed carry license, licenses, of which Illinois is the latest and the last one to adopt a, an issue type of law, and just nine states have may issue <coughs> concealed carry licenses. Perhaps that's why 66% of police chiefs, when polled in the 17th Annual National Survey of Police Chiefs and Sheriffs in 2005, believe that citizens carrying concealed firearms reduce rates of violent crime. Indeed, when barriers are lowered so that all honest, law-abiding people have the potential to defend themselves without the necessity of revealing that they actually have the means to do so, it raises the risk for would-be criminals to a very high level. This is especially true for women. 
who are far less likely to be convicted of any crime than men are, but who also hold only about a quarter of concealed carry licenses. It is ironic that those who are the most law-abiding and least likely to initiate force against another person are also the least able to provide for their own defense when the need arises. Constitutional carry changes that by removing, the, removing women from the class of easy victims. I ask you, please vote ought to pass on HB 582. Do not vote to retain this bill. This is something that women will benefit from, and it's certainly something that will lower the crime rate in New Hampshire even further. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Once again, into the fray, Sergeant Haggerty. If it's okay, Mr. Chair, I'd like to accompany him. You're his boss. I have no problem with that whatsoever. <laughs> Good afternoon, committee members. Sergeant Sean Haggy, for the record. I won't uh, again tell you my job responsibilities. I discussed that a little earlier. Uh, you do have a position paper in front of you that was drafted by Assistant Commissioner Sweeney, the Department of Safety, who I'm representing today, the State Police, opposes this bill for the reasons set forth in that position paper, as well as uh, the reasons that uh, Attorney Rice stated, as well as uh, Chief Sigourney. I would like to touch on a few additional things, if I may. And I, and I do realize that this is a long day for everyone here, and I realize that, uh, <coughs> as some other folks have said, you know, people are hungry and, and so forth, but um, I am not going to uh, not speak on behalf and opposition of this bill based on those facts because this is so important to our state. What I would ask each of you to do is to please be diligent in your research on what this bill does. Um, <clears throat> look up the statutes. Uh, look up uh, other states. There's some, been some testimony here about, about reciprocity, about constitutional carry. Uh, please do your due diligence and look up the other states' laws. Because on face value, when somebody says, uh, you know, Arizona, constitutional carry, we want to be like them. Well, look at their laws. It's not a carte blanche constitutional carry where prohibited people are able to carry concealed weapons. Whereas this bill would allow that here in this state. A little bit has been said about shall issue unless prohibited by New Hampshire statute from both possessing and owning. That's, those are the words that, that uh, leap off the page to me. Um, my position, as you are aware, is issuing non-resident pistol permits. And this law, as has been stated, requires me, shall issue, if someone does not uh, have a New Hampshire statute prohibition. Now, federal law has 10 federal prohibitions <coughs> under the Brady Bill. New Hampshire law covers really only two of those, and that's the felon as well as protective orders, which include uh, emergency orders, uh, temporary orders, and permanent orders. It's, it's interesting when we talk about uh, domestic violence laws and what's on the books today. And when you look at 173B, which is drafted by this legislature and is a good protection bill for victims, it clearly states in 173B, 
5, Roman numeral 10, section 1, uh, A1, and section B. And I'll just read briefly. And what it talks about is the authorities of the judges. And it gives, the legislature has given the judges um, directions on when to return a firearm. And it's interesting that the direction here, and I'll read it, it talks about how long they have to have a hearing on a return of firearms motion. It talks about the job, what they're looking for. And the hearing is to establish whether the defendant is subject to any state or federal law or court order that precludes the defendant from owning or possessing a firearm. If the court finds that the defendant is not subject to any state or federal law or court order precluding the ownership or possession of the firearm, or the court denies the plaintiff's request to extend the protective order, the court shall issue a written order directing the law enforcement agency to return the requested firearms. So you've given the authorities of the judges in our state direction in terms of when to return a firearm. So that same person who tries to get their firearm back, who is a misdemeanor level domestic violence abuser, can walk to the local police department, apply for a concealed permit, and that chief shall issue that permit. That's quite uh, alarming. <coughs> on the flip side, on my, in, on my job, that same would go for issuing non-resident pistol permits. If this bill were to pass, the administrative rules as we know it now that cover only non-residents, and those are the individuals who we know the least of us, those administrative rules will be null and void. The, the administrative rules that talk about suitability standards for non-residents would be gone. And I would be held to this same standard, shall issue, if not prohibited by New Hampshire statute. Again, from owning and possessing. Throughout 173B, you'll see references to state and federal law, state and federal prohibitors. I urge you to do your research on that. I'm going to briefly talk about um, just a, a couple of examples. A New Hampshire resident wants to buy a firearm and they go to a local FFL dealer and they are a illegal alien, a domestic violence abuser misdemeanor level. They have a uh, a conviction, a conviction for an offense that uh, uh, the punishment is over two years imprisonment from another state. So some states have provisions in their statute that misdemeanor offenses carry large sentences. Our sentences are all felony over a year. <coughs> Those particular people would be denied a purchase of a handgun through the FFL, through a background check that's currently being done by the state police gun line. That same person could then go down to the local police department, fill an application, DSSB 85, and that police chief would have gotten the denial packet from me that same day, indicating, go ahead and look at this for prosecution. And that police chief would be required to issue that license based on this law. Shall issue, if not prohibited, by state statute from owning and possessing. And there's a whole host of other scenarios just like that. And again, eight others, federal disqualifiers that hit on that, including illegal aliens. When we talk about the five states of constitutional carry, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this, but I would like to just pick one. And for the, for the point, I'll pick Wyoming. I had notes for all five, but I trust that you'll do your due diligence and look those up. Actually, let me give you Arizona because I heard Arizona mentioned earlier. 
Arizona is what people consider a constitutional carry state. Arizona, there is no permit required as long as you, not, you do not possess a firearm disqualifier for a disability. What that means in the application process in Arizona, age 21, U.S. citizen, not under indictment for a felony or convicted for a felony, not prohibited possessor under state or federal law, does not suffer from mental illness, or has not been adjudicated under state or federal law, not unlawfully present in the United States, have firearms competency training to get that permit. Fingerprints. The agency has 60 days to do the background investigation. Another 15 working days to issue the permit. That's Arizona. <clears throat> we have none of those. That's the state that people are touting as the const constitutional carry state. There is, a, there is one other thing I'd like to mention, and this is a, a housekeeping matter in terms of my office. I heard a question earlier about funding, about uh, what it costs. So a resident permit costs $10 for a four-year permit. As we heard, that four years could be well, longer than four years. It's, it's never under four years. And that, that's the same for non-resident pistol permits. The non-resident pistol permit is $100. Although there are no, there's no way to tell how much income comes, is coming in from the resident permits, because each jurisdiction is responsible for issuing those permits, and there's no state database for <coughs> resident concealed permits. I'll repeat that. There is no database for resident concealed permits. It doesn't exist. Any law enforcement uh, agency in the, in, the, in the state or the country can't go on their computer and see who has a resident pistol permit. So those numbers, how many each town issues, you see, you hear from small towns of 50, 55, 90, uh, larger agencies will issue in excess of 1,500 a year. Cities like Manchester or Nashua. So the math is the math, $10. In terms of non-resident pistol permits, in the last two years, we have in each of the last two years, we have been approaching a million dollars in, in uh, revenue to the general fund. We've issued <coughs> over nine thousand dollars in uh, nine thousand permits, licenses for non-resident uh, concealed carry, and over ten thousand in the last two years. And that's a I mean, that's, that's my office of, uh, which includes not only the, the pistol permit section, but the gun line, uh, licensing for security guards, and a host of other things. Um, and we have 14 days to do that. And we're doing a pretty good job of keeping up with that. So the numbers <coughs> keep going up. People want to have a New Hampshire concealed carry permit. The last thing I'll, I'll touch on is reciprocity. <coughs> this bill, it's, it's probably lost a little bit of, at the end portion of this bill, but uh, it makes some changes in the reciprocity and what's required of the Department of Safety and the State Police. It pretty much says that the Colonel must, every five years, seek out agreements. And once we seek out those agreements, they cannot expire. We can't say, oh, no, we don't want to do that anymore. That, that stays in effect unless <coughs> the, the other state has an expiration clause within that agreement. That's dangerous. That's giving it to someone else to make decisions for you. And the last thing on reciprocity that I would say is I truly believe that, uh, and, and this happens through my office, that that we get inquiries yearly from some states that we have reciprocity with, asking, has, has your gun laws changed? And I fill out the forms. No, they haven't. No, they haven't. They remain the same. If this were to pass, my response is going to be, they have changed. And this bill, if it becomes law, will go to these other states. And they will individually examine if the New Hampshire license 
is the license that they want to have acceptable in their state. I cannot comprehend that more states would sign on for reciprocity. So for that New Hampshire resident who pays their $10 every four years for that ability to have that permit to travel into 22 other states in the country, I think they're going to see a change in that. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a few questions, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, and I'll keep them as brief as I can. Um, I was looking here, and it does show the commissioner's letterhead up here, but it really doesn't show who prepared this. Uh, but if you look on the back page, I'll, I'll answer that. Assistant Commissioner Sweeney prepared that. Commissioner Sweeney did. All right, thank you. Uh, on the back page, the second to the last paragraph concerns me extremely. And if I may, uh, there is a couple, two questions in here. It starts off with certainly gang members and drug dealers from the south of the border will come to regard our <coughs> cities and towns as a free fire zone. Uh, police officers approaching vehicles at traffic stops will lose whatever um, monetary, you know, the uh, uh, advantage that they have. Um, you know, I just don't know how we're going to, you know, be a free fire zone if we have exactly or close to what Vermont has and a few other states. Because I think they have gang problems just like we do. Where will you lose your advantage, you know, not knowing if somebody's armed? Can I take that, Sarge? I'd just like to introduce myself, Robert Quinn, representative, and... I, I heard, and if I may, to, to, to answer the question, I heard some of your comments on the correlation between some of the other countries in the United States and Vermont, and I don't, I don't doubt any of your statistics. And from the, um, the woman who, who spoke before, provided some, some, I'm sure, some strong and accurate data on this issue of uh, other states and the direction they've gone in. H however, well, our, our, our opinion, my opinion is this, and I understand and I think we understand that law-abiding, honest citizens want the right to carry a weapon, carry it concealed. I'm not going to speak specifically to the revenue, whether that's a policy decision. You've heard the, the sergeant's statistics. But to that, honest, law-abiding citizens and the right to carry a gun. As the sergeant pointed out to you, and to get to your, to your disadvantage, I believe I believe it's reasonable that the method that he uses now to apply, and that being those who are fugitives from justice, persons who are unlawful users or addicted to any controlled substance, persons who have been adjudicated as mental defective <coughs> or committed to a mental institution, and it goes on, and there's, there's six others, and for those who've been convicted of a domestic violence misdemeanor. I think you have to we have to have a balance, and I agree that those who are law buying and the honest citizens who, and who haven't had any of these disqualifiers should. And as the sergeant testified earlier, they do. He disqualifies 1% of uh, thousands and thousands and thousands. So what will be the disadvantage? The disadvantage will be this, as Commissioner Sweeney, I believe, is trying to allude to. The disadvantage is with this, all of these prohibitors, all of these disqualifiers are now off the window. So if you have done this or that, are in this condition, you can carry a weapon concealed. And I, I, I don't see how that improves safety for the public, for officers, for victims of crimes. I don't see how that does. So today, as he uses it day in and day out, and with this bill, it would only be his only guide, well, for, for a local police chief would be the felony conviction, or the answer, stalking, restraining order, or any bail conditions. Other than that, if they have any one of these other 10 disqualifiers, they can still carry, he shall issue the permit. So I think that's where we're going with this. Okay. And a follow up. Follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for that. Uh, I do appreciate your clarification on that. 
Um, I do have some Vermont state troopers that w are more than willing to come over and train you on how to protect yourself in that area. Uh, but you, I think that's a little out of order. I, I apologize then. Uh, well, is it, and just as a comment to that, I think that somebody, I think that to just be, to be, to stay, to stay to the point, I think that somebody who has been adjudicated as a mental defective or has been committed to a mental institution, I don't think shall be given a license, a permit, or the ability to carry a concealed weapon. And I, I would do not agree. think that will be safe for a police officer, yep. for you, or for anyone in this room. And I would agree. And I don't think this bill but if, does but, that. But uh, if I may continue, and if you would agree to that, this bill would, would eliminate that. Then I'll have to look at that side of it. Uh, but you also, uh, yes, but the commissioner also alluded that uh, uh, tourist families would be in fear of coming here. Um, you know, I was just wondering, you know, again, to go to Alaska, to pick that state in Vermont, has a huge, huge tourism, you know, base. So are you saying that, you know, we're going to close the borders to tourism? No. You know, no, no, I'm not. And, and, and as I tried to say, I, I agree with, with everything you said in your statistics. And, but all it takes is one event. Yeah. All it takes is one incident, one event. It does. Someone will lose their life for multiple. That's all. I think there's a balance. And what, what I'm trying to say is currently the method that we have, I don't think that's the right term, but that, that what we apply in our decision are whether they are convicted of a, a qualifying felony in this state, whether they have those three conditions, the stalking, restraining, or the bail <coughs> conditions. But then we look at these other prohibitors, the federal ones, which which would not apply. And I think those are the ones that, uh, that, that concern me, concern. And, and again, even when you put all of this together, so what he's doing day in and day out, it's 1%. 1% that get denied. Some get delayed. You know, they try their very best in there to keep the applications going. They have three business days. And to go back to Representative Marston's question, just to clear it up for everybody, and we, we spoke in the hallway, as the sergeant said, those that are delay, denied, he puts a packet together, and there's a law in the book for those who are trying to attempt to buy illegally. He sends it to the law enforcement agency of jurisdiction. They take it. Sometimes they make a case. Sometimes they don't. And sometimes people apply to buy a gun. And they don't realize that they did something in the past that actually wasn't disqualified. So I think that the police agency does their own investigation and determines whether they're going to make an arrest or it was, a, it was an error. And I know that the Hooksett police chief told me that they did uh, uh, 58 last year that we referred, that they actually went out and did cases. So I just wanted, wanted to kind of clear that up because I think he is he's doing a tremendous job in there. And what I see with this bill the piece that concerns me is, is, and I think, uh, and do you have which line that is, if I may? It's, a, uh, it's basically uh, on the first page. It's, it's, uh, it's 11 and 12? 11 and 12. Okay, that's thank you. Base, that's and that's the piece, just, just so everybody understands, and I encourage you, as the sergeant said, take a look at the federal prohibitors, yeah. because those prohibitors would now not come into play. That, that's thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I do mean no re uh, disrespect. Uh, uh, with no, my no, question. Yeah. I know there's a lot of passion here with this, and I just think that in everything you have to strike a balance. I'd like to point out that neither the sergeant or the colonel wrote the letter, and the author is not here, yes. so it's very hard for them mm -hmm. to answer what mm -hmm. the author intended. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr.